Soon, we are going to define Reed-Solomon codes, a family of codes that meets the singleton bound and admits fast algorithms and is just generally really cool and useful. But before we get there, we need to talk about polynomials over finite fields. We can define a polynomial over a finite field the same way as we do over the reals. That is, we say that a univariate polynomial in the variable capital X over the field FQ of degree D is of the form f of x equals a naught plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared plus dot 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 plus ad times x to the d, where all of the coefficients ai come from this field, and the top coefficient ad is non-zero. The collection of all univariate polynomials in the variable capital X over fq is denoted like this as fq square brackets capital X. Just a note, depending on your background, using a capital X as a variable in a polynomial is either totally normal or totally weird. If it's totally weird, uh, sorry, we're, we're going to do it. A useful fact about polynomials over the reals or over finite fields is that low degree polynomials do not have too many roots. More precisely, a non-zero polynomial f of degree at most d has at most d roots. Here, a root of a polynomial is just a value x and fq so that f of x is equal to zero. So this is saying the number of x's so that f of x is equal to zero is at most d for a degree d polynomial. This fact is just stupidly useful. We are going to use this again and again and again throughout these videos. In fact, this fact is so useful that we are going to introduce a new character, Polly, the polynomial interpolation parrot, just to emphasize this fact. Right, low degree polynomials don't have too many roots. Thanks, Polly. Okay, so why is this fact true? If you believe that sort of polynomial arithmetic over FQ works roughly the way it oughta, here's a quick proof. So proof, if f of alpha is equal to zero for some particular alpha in FQ, then the polynomial x minus alpha, so this is a degree one polynomial, this divides f of x. But that means that if f of x had, let's say, d plus one roots, say alpha one up through alpha d plus one, then the product of all of those polynomials, x minus alpha i, is going to divide f of x. But this is a degree d plus one polynomial, so that means that f better have degree at least d plus one. Okay, so this is not a full proof because we're sort of assuming that polynomial division and roots and stuff like that works kind of the way you expect it to. Uh, but if, if you believe that, then hopefully this convinces you that a polynomial of degree at most d has at most d roots. If you want a full proof from first principles, go check out an algebra textbook. Just to make sure we understand this extremely useful fact that low degree polynomials don't have too many roots, let's look at some quick examples over F3. To check your understanding, pause the video now and figure out how many roots each one of these polynomials has over F3. Okay, so here's the answers. F of x equals x squared minus one has two roots over F3. Those two roots are 1 and 2. And we can see that just by checking that f of 2 is equal to f of 1 is equal to 0. And we can see that there's not a third root because f of 0 is equal to minus 1, or 2 mod 3, which is decidedly not 0. Similarly, x squared plus 2x plus 1 has one root over f3. It's because f of 2 is equal to 9, which is equal to 0 mod 3. And once again, you can check that neither 0 nor 1 are roots of this polynomial. And f of x equals x squared plus 1 has 0 roots. To see that, we can just check that f of 0 is equal to 1, f of 1 is equal to 2, and f of 2 is equal to 5, which is equal to 2 mod 3. In particular, these examples show that while degree two polynomials in this case have at most two roots, 
they might have fewer than two roots. Notice also that this last polynomial, x squared plus 1, this does have a root in f2, because 1 plus 1 is equal to 0 mod 2, so f of 1 is equal to 0 mod 2. So this shows that the choice of field matters for the number of roots of a polynomial. A useful concept when talking about polynomials over finite fields and polynomial evaluation and polynomial interpolation is Vandermond matrices. So here's a definition. A Vandermond matrix is a matrix of this form. That is, we're going to pick n distinct values, alpha 1 up through alpha n, in some field f, and then we're going to let v be the matrix so that the ijth entry of v is alpha i to the j. So it looks like this. So the first column is just a column of ones. That's all of the alpha i's to the zero. The next column is just all of the alpha i's. The next column is all of the alpha i's squared, and so on, up to all of the alpha i's to the m for some integer m. A useful fact about Vandermond matrices is that square Vandermond matrices are invertible. Here's a quick proof. Let V be a square Vandermond matrix. We want to show that V is invertible, which is equivalent to showing that the kernel of V is just zero. That is, we'd like to show that if V times A is equal to zero for some vector A, then A itself must be zero. All right, well, let's check this. Suppose that A is the vector with coordinates A0, A1, A2, dot, dot, dot. Then V times A is equal to a vector where the first entry is the sum over I of AI alpha 1 to the I. The second entry is the sum over I AI alpha 2 to the I, and so on. All the way up to AI alpha n to the I. Here, this is just the definition of matrix vector multiplication when the matrix in question looks like this. But now this is equal to the vector with entries f of alpha 1, f of alpha 2, dot dot dot, f of alpha n, where f of x is the polynomial sum over i a i x to the i. Notice that the degree of this f is less than or equal to n minus 1. Since this sum here, sorry that I didn't write the indices, goes from 0 to n minus 1. This implies one of two things happen. Either f is the 0 polynomial, which implies that a itself is equal to 0, or f is a non-zero low-degree polynomial. Right! Low-degree polynomials don't have too many roots. Thanks, Polly. So since low-degree polynomials don't have too many roots, that would imply that f of x has strictly less than n roots, and that implies that v times a is not the zero vector, because v times a consists of n polynomial evaluations, and strictly less than n of them can be zero. Thus, either a is equal to zero, or v times a is not equal to zero, and that's what we wanted to show. Okay, so square van der Bond matrices are invertible. Let me erase this proof so that we can have space to write a corollary. So the corollary is that any square submatrix of a van der Bond matrix is also invertible. Here's a proof. Any such submatrix looks like this. That is, it's an R by R matrix, so that the jth powers of some of the alphas live here, the j plus first powers are there, and so on. But this matrix is equal to D times V, where D is a diagonal matrix with diagonal entries alpha i to the j, alpha i plus 1 to the j, up through alpha i plus r to the j, and v is a van der Bond matrix. So by the fact v is invertible 
and D is a diagonal matrix with non-zeros on the diagonal, so it's also invertible, so their product is invertible. So that proves the corollary. Those facts about van der Bond matrices imply the very useful fact that polynomial interpolation quote-unquote works over FQ. So what do I mean by that? Here's a theorem. Suppose we are given d plus 1 pairs alpha i, y i, for i equals 0 up to d, and think of these as pairs of evaluation points and values, then there is a unique polynomial of degree at most d, called f, so that f of alpha i is equal to y i for all i equals 0 up to d. Here's a proof. Let's write a polynomial f as the sum from i equals 0 to d of a i times x to the i, where the a i are going to be coefficients in f cube. So for such a polynomial f, f of alpha i is equal to y i for all i if and only if the following linear system is satisfied. So here we have a square van der Mond matrix, V, where the evaluation points are alpha naught up through alpha d. Here we have a vector A whose entries are the coefficients of the polynomial. And just like we saw on an earlier slide, when we multiply V by A, this is basically the same as just evaluating the polynomial F at all of these evaluation points, alpha naught through alpha d. And so what it means for f of alpha i to be equal to y i is that this matrix vector product is equal to the vector y, whose components are just y naught up through y d. But because square van der Mond matrices are invertible, like we just saw, this linear equation holds if and only if the vector a is equal to v inverse times y. So that means that the unique polynomial f that interpolates these points has coefficients given by v inverse times y. And that proves the theorem. Just a note, this proof actually shows that not only is there a unique such polynomial f, but actually we can find it very efficiently. All we have to do is solve a linear system. Actually, we can find it even more efficiently than that. It turns out there's sort of a fast Fourier transform type algorithm that you can use to multiply by a van der Mond matrix or its inverse. So actually, we can find these coefficients a in time something like d log d. OK, so we've just seen a bunch of useful facts about polynomials. Why do we care so much about polynomials over finite fields? One reason is this other fact about polynomials, which is that Every function f from a finite field fq to the finite field fq is given by some polynomial, some polynomial of degree at most q minus 1. Here's a proof. Suppose that f is some function from fq to fq. Now consider the unique polynomial of degree at most q minus 1 that interpolates through all the points in fq. Such a polynomial exists by the theorem that we saw on the previous slide. But now this polynomial is exactly the polynomial we're looking for. It agrees with f on every single point in the field, and it has degree at most q minus 1. One quick example of this. Consider the polynomial f of x equals x to the q. By the fact above, this must have some representation as a polynomial of degree at most q minus 1. What is it? If you're familiar with finite fields, you might guess, correctly, that its f of x is just equal to x. The reason for this is another useful fact, which is that for all alpha in fq, alpha to the q is just equal to itself. So that implies that this polynomial has exactly the same evaluations as this polynomial. As for why this fact is true, 
Well, it's a fun exercise to try to prove it yourself, or you can check out an algebra textbook. Okay, now we know all of the facts about polynomials that we need to know to define Reed-Solomon codes. We'll do that in the next video.